everybody i want to greet you in the mighty name of jesus christ our soon coming king truly there is none like him there's none to be compared to him amen from the rising of the sun the bible says unto the going down of the very same the name of our god is worthy to be praised now for the past few weeks uh, bishop daly was teaching the subject on prophecy he was looking at where we are practically in the world today and he covered um, excellently this subject here as the rapture you know the millennium reign of jesus christ so on and so forth and he gave us a better understanding of the whole subject area of prophecy and for that we are grateful and we are blessed to have men of god in the house who can deliver and teach the subject with such clarity praise god now tonight my aim is to look at another area that i realize that a lot of people have issues with a lot of people over the years have been questioning uh, the whole topic of the sabbath um, i've seen where people uh, who are not convinced are not so what uh, in tune so what in what the scripture has to say walk out of the house of god because they are convinced that we are not keeping the sabbath even to the point where we look in scriptures and we realize that there is no repeated command that one should keep the sabbath in the new testament even to that fact we have seen where the bible reinforces in the new testament that one should not steal or one should not kill and one should not commit adultery amen but we have never seen it reinforced in the new testament at all but even for that fact people are still convinced that because it was there in the old covenant it was there in the old testament uh, they wonder if the christians today should keep the sabbath praise god so for probably this week and next week amen next two weeks or so we're going to discuss the whole issue of the sabbath we're going to try to take it as slowly as possible we're trying to try to build a proper foundation around the whole subject area so that we as children of god can be fully equipped and understand the work that jesus accomplished for us at calvary praise god now let me start by saying that there are three views um, out there as it relates to the whole issue of the sabbath there are three views that exist as it relates to the sabbath firstly there is the seventh day sabbatarianism secondly there's what is called the first day sabbatarianism and last there is what is called anti sabbatarianism so we have let me say it again the seventh day sabbatarianism we have the first day sabbatarianism and you have what is called the anti sabbatarianism now let's just try to differentiate between each of these three views and try to establish where where we should be as it relates to the whole issue as a christian now the first view which is the seventh day sabbatarianism it actually teaches that the sabbath continued on the seventh day of the week and has done so since creation in other words they are saying that the sabbath started uh, at creation and continues even to this present day amen and the persons who actually uh, push for this particular view we are fully aware of them. the most dominant one would have been the probably the seventh day adventists even though they are not the only seven day worshiping uh, brethren as it were we have other persons out there who actually believe in this thing as well like for example the seven day baptist the seven day church of god so on and so forth but they teach that the sabbath continues on the seventh day of the week and has done so since creation amen but is this what the bible actually teaches amen the other view is the first day sabbatarianism and this view teaches that christ having established the new creation or the new covenant uh, and now resting from his work he changed the sabbath to the first day of the week now while 
it is plausible and I've heard people even in church says my Sabbath is the first day of the week I I don't subscribe to first day Sabbatarianism why because while we worship on a Sunday we don't call the Sunday the Sabbath the Sunday is not the Sabbath uh, the Sunday is the first day of the week if we were supposed to go back to what scriptures actually say and we were supposed to, as a church if it was a command to the church to keep the Sabbath it would have been not on the first day of the week however we can not deny the fact also that history has it that the church used to worship on the first day of the week there are occasions where the church used to worship on the first day of the week there was an example in the book of Acts where the Bible said that the church met on the first day of the week amen Paul was supposed to leave to go somewhere uh, and they, they, they held church that first day and after that he left the other day there's another example where the Bible talk about them gathering uh, and collecting offerings as it were um, on the first day of the week and even extra biblical documents um, say like documents that were at the end of the first century they actually teach that it was a custom for most of the saints to meet somewhat on the first day of the week I mean so that there is a truth to the fact that the church in the first century the second century even before Roman Catholicism came in uh, there was it is a custom for the church to meet somewhat on the first day of the week but to state that the first day of the week has changed the Sabbath uh, from the Saturday to the Sunday that is what I do agree with so there's the, the whole issue of first day Sabbatarianism it has some truth but it has some errors in there there is truth that the church as I said before usually sometimes meet on the first day of the week and we can see that some examples in scriptures however there is no truth to the fact that Jesus gave the authority for anyone to change the Sabbath to the first day of the week amen but there's another view and this is the view that I subscribe to and this is the view that we are trying to propose to us tonight the view teaches that the Sabbath was a shadow of Christ and the rest from the works that we have in him in other words we believe that just like all the other ceremonials and rituals that existed in the Old Testament which plays a important part in Israel in the Old Testament however there they, they had an ending point because they were only symbolic of what Christ was about to do in the New Testament praise God so for example it was customary for them to carry a lamb and they would bring the lamb to the priest and the priest would have killed the lamb offered him on the burnt offering for the sins of the people praise God and we realize that the lamb that existed at that time was simply a shadow of who the true lamb is when John saw Jesus coming he said behold the lamb of God which take it away the sins of the world so all the lamb that were killed in the Old Testament was just a shadow of and in a similar way we believe that the Sabbath was just a shadow of Christ and the rest so it's a shadow of the rest from the work that we have in Christ Jesus praise God now in order for us to get a full understanding of what the scriptures are teaching it's important that we go back to the basics we go back to what the Bible actually teaches is from the book of Genesis from the beginning go back to the earliest mention of the Sabbath or better yet, of the Sabbath or the seventh day and we're going to try to go there and we're going to try to work our way through the scriptures to see if we can establish what exactly does the Bible actually teach our aim in doing this is to get a whole picture of what God has revealed on this subject both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament so if we are going to get a good idea of what God is saying as it relates to the Sabbath it's important that we go back to the beginning and secondly we want to ensure that at the end of the day we get a good picture an overall view a good understanding of the subject both as it's revealed to us 
in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. So brethren, let us start in Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, and we are looking at chapter 2 from verse 1 to 3. Now, this is an interesting uh, chapter because it is a continuation of what God was doing in Genesis chapter 1. If you can remember, in Genesis chapter 1, uh, Christ actually did six days of creation. Amen. Six days of creation was done in Genesis chapter 1. And then when we reach Genesis chapter 2, it seemed like there was a continuation. In other words, he continued, the story continued from chapter 1 into chapter 2. And in chapter 2, it starts with the fact that Christ created the heaven and the earth were finished. So when the creation of heaven and earth was finished, it gives an overall summary of everything that took place in chapter 1. And it goes now into chapter 2. And let's just look at the scripture. Genesis chapter 2 from verse 1 to 3. It says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Because that in it he had rested from all his work which he created and made. Praise God. Now, it's important. There are some important things that we can pull out of Genesis chapter 2 from verse 1 to 3. Some important points. Firstly, on the seventh day, God rested from all his work. And that should be work. So on the seventh day, God rested from all his work. Now, let us make some good uh, observation as it relates to this. We want to properly, what we call, exegete uh, Genesis chapter 2 from verse 1 to 3. Let me make clear to you the point that God did not rest because he was tired. Amen. This is very important because a lot of people read the scripture and they say, see it, God kept the Sabbath. But God, what the scripture said that God rested from all his work. What does this actually mean? And I can first say that God did not rest because he was tired. Actually, the Bible tells us in Psalm chapter 24 and verse 4 that he that keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleep. The Bible also says in Isaiah chapter 40 verse 28, Has thou not known, has thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is he weary. There is no searching of his understanding. Can I tell you, brethren, that if God had stopped working, then we would have ceased to exist. Because the Bible also tells us in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3 that he uphold all things by the word of his power. It means that if God had stopped working, which means there was no activity on the part of God, then trust me, you could not breathe. Trust me, the stars would have ceased to shine because they are held up by the power of God's word. Amen. So when we say God rested from all his work, he didn't rest because he was tired. You and I rest because we are tired, but not God. But can I tell you, when the Bible says God rested, it actually means that God ceased to work in relation to his creation. In other words, God stopped. The creation was complete. There was nothing more to add to the creation process. And therefore, that was it. He stopped. So when the Bible says on the seventh day God rested, the Greek, Hebrew word, sorry, there, speaks to the fact that God ceased to work in relation to the whole issue of creation. Now, let me show you another principle, uh, an ex another example of this, so you can get an, an idea of where I'm going. And, and this is in relation to Jesus Christ and how he brought about redemption. Let us look at Hebrews chapter 10 
and verse 12. It says, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Uh, verse 9 actually starts it a little better. He said, Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will. And God has taken away the first that he may establish the second. So that is very important in going into this particular verse. He removed the first so he can establish the second. But let us get to verse 11. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice which can never take away sins but this man in reference to Jesus after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever sat down on the right hand of God so it shows the contrast firstly between the priest and Jesus Christ the priest standeth daily while Jesus when he did his work he sat down now, let us move on to bring this out a little more. The priest stood every day offering sacrifices suggests that they were not in the posture of rest. And the reason for this is that every day they would offer again and again more and more sacrifices. They, if you offer the lamb today, amen, and you committed sin, there's going to need another lamb uh, to deal with your sin issues. So the definite sacrifice for sin had not been offered yet. So every single day, the priest stood. A posture of work. A posture showing that he is continuously doing something. Every day he offered sacrifice suggesting that they were not in a posture of rest. But look at Jesus. But Jesus, the Bible said, after he offered one sacrifice, and that one sacrifice is him actually himself, he offered himself for sin, the Bible said he sat down. In other words, the work of redemption was complete, meaning the sacrifice of Jesus finished the work that the priests were only working for and for thousands of years. For thousands of years, daily, they stood working, 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 offering sacrifice, offering sacrifice. But Jesus came on the scene being a more superior sacrifice to that of the high priest or all the other priests that exist. He offered himself. And guess what? When he was finished, he stopped working. There is no more need uh, for Jesus to do any more work as relates to our redemption so guess what he did he sat down but does that actually mean that what that does that actually mean that he stopped working altogether no it just speaks in the context of our salvation he sat down and he stopped working and I like the scriptures that says we are seated together with him in heavenly places which means that because of the work of Christ at Calvary, we also can sit down. Because the work of Christ has brought about full salvation in our lives. Praise God. Now let us go back to Genesis chapter 2 from verse 1 to 3 and continue our exegesis as it relates to this. So the first point we said that when the Bible said that God rested, it simply means that God stopped. The second thing is that God blessed and sanctified the seventh day. And because we understand that when we move into the seventh day, it's a blessed period, especially for man. Man was created on the sixth day. Now man is in perfect communion with God. Now, the seventh day is not necessarily a 24-hour day. The seventh day... The word there used in the Hebrew actually can speak to a long period of time. We don't know how long the seventh day is. But as long as man uh, was in right communion with God, God blessed and sanctified the seventh day. Amen. So we see two important points. But there's a third point that I want to bring out. That's also very important. There are no commandments given at this time. For man to keep the Sabbath. This is where a lot of people. Uh, 
get it wrong because they read the scripture and they say that the scripture teaches them that seed from Genesis man was supposed to keep the Sabbath. But we're going to realize as we go along that nobody actually kept the Sabbath from this point on. Actually, no commandment was given by God for any man to keep the Sabbath at this point in time. So let us move to some very important points. There is no indication in scripture that man observed the Sabbath before the time of Moses. There's none. There's not one hint in scripture that actually teaches us that. And this is based on two reasons. Firstly, the law was given to Moses and to the children of Israel 430 years after Abraham. That's in your Bible. I'm going to look at the scriptures. Secondly, the Sabbath was introduced with the law at Sinai. So if the law was given 430 years after Abraham, that is during the time of Moses, and secondly, the whole issue of the law of the Sabbath was introduced along with the law that was given, then obviously nobody before this time actually did observe a Sabbath day. Let's just look at some of the scriptures um, that speak about this. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 17, it says, And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, if you read the scriptures above, it was talking about Abraham. So 430 years after that fact, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. So the scripture here teaches that the law actually came 430 years after Abraham. Now, let's move on again to Nehemiah chapter 9 from verse 13 to 14. It says, Thou camest down also upon Mount Sinai and spakest with them from heaven and gavest them right judgment and true laws, good statutes and commandments, and madest them known unto them thy holy Sabbath and commandest them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses thy servant. So here it is that the scripture is telling that the law was given 430 years in Galatia and now Nehemiah is saying that what was given in the law and it was given by the hands of Moses the commandments, right judgments, so on and so forth, the holy sabbath, all of these things, the precepts the statues, they were given by Moses, by the hand of Moses thy servant Amen. Let's move a little further in Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 3 the Lord made not this covenant. And here the scripture, here this, this scripture is talking about the word Deuteronomy speaks to second law. Because if, if you can remember, Exodus, they got the whole commandment first in the book of Exodus. Eh? And the, when the children of Israel spent, didn't enter into the promised land because of their unbelief, they spent how much years into the desert. And when that generation died out, that came out originally. Everybody that I think was 20 years and over who lived on, praise God, God had to give them the law again. And in giving them the law again, here it is that they are saying, the Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us who are all of us here alive this day. So they are saying that the covenant that God is about to make with them, and he did it at Sinai, God did not make it with the fathers. And when the Bible refers to our fathers, in scripture it's practically talking about uh, Abraham Isaac and Jacob so the Lord may not this covenant I'm going to talk about this the Lord may not this covenant and the covenant is talking about what God gave Moses at Mount Sinai God may not this covenant with our fathers he did not make the covenant with Abraham he did not make the covenant with Isaac or Jacob but with us even us who are all of us here alive this day. So we see that the scriptures clearly teaches us that the law was given to Moses and the children of Israel 430 years after Abraham and the Sabbath was introduced with the law at Sinai. We saw that clearly in scripture. Amen. Now, there was no mention 
brothers and sisters, there was no mention of anyone keeping the Sabbath uh, before Moses. And we just said that a while ago. So it brings two questions to my mind. One, when did this Sabbath observation actually begin? Because if the Sabbath was not given before Moses, and it was not commanded in the book of Genesis, then when did this Sabbath observation actually begin? When did it start? And another good question to ask is, why did God say, remember, in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8? And we're going to try to, 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 to look at these. Let's, let's just try to look at when this Sabbath thing actually started in Scripture. Praise God. Now, in Exodus chapter 16 and verse 23, you can remember in Exodus chapter 16, God miraculously did deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. You can remember the whole history about the plagues and how he uh, brought them out with a strong hand. Amen. And they were now in the wilderness. But yet still they started to get hungry and they were asking God, for food, they're asking God for bread and they're asking God for, 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 for to sustain them, which God would not have brought them into the wilderness for them to die. But they begged God and, and, and God said, okay, he's going to provide for them. So in Exodus chapter 16, the scripture clearly states that they woke up one morning and they saw manna on the earth. It's interesting that they, when they saw the manna on the earth, the question they asked each other was, what is this? Uh, that's interesting because when you say mana in Hebrew, that's exactly what it is. It's saying, what is it? So they asked God for bread. God provided the bread for them. When they got up and they saw the bread, they couldn't recognize the bread. Now let's bring this up a little further. Not drifting from the Sabbath, but let's just look at the point I just made. Jesus is the bread of life, the bread from heaven. Amen. He is the bread from heaven. And the Bible said he came unto his own. And when he came unto his own, he, the Messiah, the people could not recognize. So in a similar fashion, when God provided manna for them in the wilderness, and they're asking, what is this? When the bread from heaven came down from heaven, amen, and Jesus the Christ, they were asking the question, what is this? They were asking, who, who is this? Amen. The Messiah that they look for and they ask for came on the scene. No one of the Bible said in St. John that he came unto his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he what? Power to become the sons of God. But God gave them a commandment in Exodus chapter 16. As it relates to how they are going to deal with the bread. That he sent from heaven. Praise God. He said, and I'm reading Exodus chapter 16 verse 23. And he said unto them. That is that which the Lord had said. Tomorrow is the rest of the holy sabbath unto the lord this is the first time we are hearing a mention of the word sabbath bake that which ye will bake today and see that which ye will see and that which would make it over lay up for you to be kept until the morning let's just try to dig this down a little more here we find the first indication that the seventh day Sabbath was retreated differently. God sent matter from heaven and told them that daily they should gather according to what was there. So every day, gather what was there. Gather as much as you need. Don't take more than you need. Just gather as much as you need as it comes on the earth. On the sixth day, God made a, 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 a change. He said on the sixth day of every week now, gather twice as much as you would need. Why he said that? So that no gathering will be done on the seventh day. So after this event, 
that took place in Acts, in Exodus chapter 16. Four chapters later, we realize that God gave the commandment at Sinai. And what did God say? God said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. What should they remember? God is pointing back, pointing them back to this event. Because this was the first mention of the term Sabbath to them as Israelites. God is reminding them that, look here, I've, met, I've set up something now. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Again, let us look at why God used the term remember. In the book of Deuteronomy, and we did say what Deuteronomy actually speaks to, speaks to second law. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 12 to 15, and I skipped out uh, some of it, but you can read through all of it. I just made, highlight the main points. It says, keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it as the Lord thy God had commanded thee. Now go down, he said, and remember thou that, remember that thou was a servant or a slave in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore, in other words, for that reason, the Lord thy God command thee to keep the Sabbath. Now, we see a lot of things here. Obviously, he was talking to a set of people that were slaves in Egypt. He was talking to a set of people that he brought out with a mighty hand and a stretch out hand. And it was for this set of reason, for this particular reason, God is saying, therefore, for that cause, the Lord commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. So when God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, God is saying, remember what I have done for you, Israel. I have brought you out of Egypt. Remember what I've done for you, Egypt. For you, Israel, sorry. I brought you out with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm. Remember this. Because this is going to be something between me and you. Now, it brings me now to the big question. Does this command apply to the New Testament church? Look at all the stuff that I've said earlier was the New Testament church in Egypt did God deliver us out of Egypt with a strong hand and with a outstretched arm no I don't think so so I could summarize and say right here that no it doesn't apply but let us go a little deeper it doesn't apply as in us observing the seventh day Sabbath weekly but let us take it a little deeper to make a point we're going to define something that God is going to use in relation to the Ten Commandments. God called the Ten Commandments a covenant. And let us define what a covenant is. A covenant from a Bible perspective is an agreement or a contract made between God and man. It's important that when we look at a, an agreement between God and man, it sometimes it is it, it, it can be towards a particular individual sometimes it can be towards a particular group of people but all we know that when he makes a covenant it tends to be between a signed out agreement between man and God or God and man I put it to you this morning I put it to you tonight that the Ten Commandments is a special covenant relationship with Israel and are with God or with the children of Israel and God's people. So the Ten Commandments is a special covenant relationship with the children of Israel and with God. And, and this is important because when God makes covenant, we say that covenant is a special agreement or a contract. Not all covenants in scripture even though all scripture is given by inspiration of God, applies necessarily to you. For example, it would have caused, made Noah of none effect to not eat of the tree that was in the midst of his garden because that was not a covenant between him and God. And it would have made no sense to Adam to build an, a, an ark because it would have, there was not the agreement between him. So we have to find out in scripture and this, this comes from what we call hermeneutics, which is a fancy word, which means 
the how we interpret scriptures. One of the important things we have to understand is who God is talking to and why God is talking to this particular person. So when God made the covenant of the Ten Commandments, who was it for? It was a special covenant relationship with Israel or the children of Israel and with God. Now, there is nothing in the Bible that says that the Ten Commandments provides a legislation for mankind. Nothing. You might say, but we actually do some things that the Ten Commandments say. We do not steal. We do not commit adultery. So I'm going to look at that. But the Ten Commandments by itself, as given to Moses on Mount Sinai, there is nothing in the Bible that says that it was a legislation uh, between for all mankind. Actually, the Bible teaches that the Ten Commandments are the words of the old covenant. And remember I said before, the covenant is an agreement between God and man. And I talk about a biblical covenant, an agreement between God and man, or God and Israel, or God and a person. So here it is that the Ten Commandments, the Bible oftentimes refer to it as the words of of the old covenant. And when I talk about the Ten Commandments, I'm talking about all the Ten Commandments. I'm going to look a little deeper into that. Let's look at some scriptures that back up this point. Exodus chapter 34 and verse 28. It says, And he was there with the Lord, talking about Moses, forty days and forty nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the word of the covenant. What is that? The Ten Commandments. So the words of the covenant is the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments is the words of the covenant. It's the covenant between God and Israel. Let's look at another verse. Exodus chapter 31 and verse 18. And he was... Uh, and he was there with the Lord 40 days. And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communion with him upon Mount Sinai two tables of testimony table of stone written with the finger of God so again we see where the same particular thing where he was given uh, the tables of testimony was given to Moses amen look at Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 13 and he declared unto you his covenant so if you look at the verse we talked about in Exodus a while ago you're talking about what was written on the uh, written with his fingers of God. And now in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 13, we're seeing that what was written with the fingers of God is the covenant, his covenant, the Ten Commandments. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 13, and he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even Ten Commandments. And he wrote them upon tables of stone. So, the Ten Commandments simply is a is the agreement that God had made with Israel. The Ten Commandments is the word of the covenant. The Ten Commandments simply is the overall big plan that God had for Israel. It's an agreement between God and Israel. And one might ask, yes, but isn't the Sabbath a part of the Ten Commandments? And we're going to look at that. Because when we move into the Ten we, we already established in scriptures that the Ten Commandments is the word of the covenant. In other words, it is the, it is the big summary of what God would want Israel to do. Now, apart from that, a lot of people don't realize is that apart from the Ten Commandments, there were 613 other laws. And what these laws did, they interpreted the Ten Commandments. So the Ten Commandments were on tables of stone. Then there were 613 commandments that interpreted the Ten Commandments for Israel. So for example, God will say, Remember, uh, God will say, mm, uh, let me, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, for example. We find that 
in the Ten Commandments. But in the 613 other laws, we find how do I keep the Sabbath? So the Ten Commandments tell you this, but the 613 actually interprets for the Ten. So we see now, when you're keeping the Sabbath, do not light a fire. Do not go without, within a certain distance from your house. So on and so forth. It explains to us, or interprets for us, uh, the Ten Commandments for Israel. So the Ten Commandments is the word of the covenant. The 613 other laws interpret those Ten Commandments. But here's an interesting fact too. Within the Ten Commandments is the Sabbath. So how do we actually see the Sabbath in the Ten Commandments? The Sabbath was special because in the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath was the sign between God and Israel. So the Sabbath was special because it was a sign between God and Israel. It was the sign of the covenant. And, and, and I, know, I, know, I know I'm going a little bit fast, but I'm going to break it down a little bit to bring up a point that I'm trying to make it. Now let us look at a few scriptures that confirm this truth first. That the Sabbath was simply a sign of the covenant. In Exodus chapter 31 verse 16 to 17, the Bible says, Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. I'm going to say, this is the Sabbath now. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So this verse actually tells you that the Sabbath is the sign of the perpetual covenant that God had. Amen. Look at another scripture. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 12. Moreover also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them. That they might know that I am the Lord that sanctifieth them. Let's move on. The only way the Sabbath could be a sign between God and Israel is the fact that the sign is unique to the relationship. The sign was unique to the relationship that God would have with Israel. So God gave them ten commandments. And in the middle, and what we, do, what we need to understand too, is that if you look at the law of remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, in the Hebrew language that is, it is found directly into the middle of, the, of that ten commandments. The dead middle. If you should count from the first, right down to where remember begins, and come from the last and come right back to where it ends. That remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You will realize it falls dead in the middle. And I might say, why is that? Because in those days, it was custom for them to put the sign of the covenant in the middle of the contract. So the sign was, was between God and Israel. And it had to be a special sign. Something that was unique to them. Amen. So let us look at what exactly does a sign do. A sign is a visible representation of something. The sign represents the thing. The Sabbath sign was a visible representation of everything that was in the Mosaic Covenant. So everything that the covenant stood for was represented in the Sabbath. The Sabbath was the centerpiece. It is what, what separated them. It is what Israel would do to know that they are actually following the other ten. So it's the sign that represented the other ten. Now, to make it a little easier, let me give you an example. In every country, there is a constitution. In every country, there is a constitution. A constitution are the general laws that govern the particular country. In the case of Jamaica, and I called a lawyer today to confirm, there is what is called case laws or judicial laws. In America, you have what is called the Bill of Rights. Eh? 
And what these do, they interpret the Constitution. So you have the Constitution of the country, you have the Bill of Rights that explains or interprets the Constitution. But if you should reduce the full Constitution to a symbol or a sign, it would be the flag. So the flag is the Constitution, the visible sign of a particular country's constitution. So in a similar way, the Ten Commandments. Then you have 613 commandments that explains the Ten Commandments. But the sign that is actually, if you should reduce the Ten Commandments to a physical sign, a visible sign, it would have been the Sabbath. Now let's look at some things in the United States as it relates to their flag. In 1968, Congress approved, and I saw this today on the internet, Congress approved the federal flag desecration law after a Vietnam War protest. The law made it illegal to knowingly cast contempt upon any flag of the United States by publicly mutilating, defacing, defiling, burning, and trampling upon it. In other words, if you are caught doing anything like that, you're in some serious problems. The other thing says that the burning of the U.S. flag is very illegal. But yet the burning of every flag is illegal. And those found doing so will face punishment. The Republicans said that those who burn the American flag will lose their citizenship instantly if they catch you or face one year in jail. I was a cadet in high school. And I learned at the time that when we are going with the flag, the flag should not touch the ground. We're told that the flag, when it's been raised, when it's been raised, can you must be very careful with how you move around with the flag. You treat the flag very well. And you might say, why? Because the flag is the symbol of everything that Jamaica's constitution stands for. Have you ever watched the news and realized, for example, recently when they killed the guy, um, Selamani, when they killed that guy and um, the country was retaliating Iran, and I saw it clearly on the news where while they can't get to America per se, what they would do is that they would burn the flags. What are they saying? Them burning the flags or stamping on the flags or writing on the flags or desecrating the flag is saying clearly to the US that we are in no, no regard for the Constitution of the United States of America. They are in no regard for anything that the US stands for. And how they do that? By desecrating the flag. Because they know that everything that U.S. stands for is embedded in that particular sign. In a similar way, in a similar way, God said that the Sabbath was a sign between him and Israel forever. It was the sign of the covenant. And he made sure to tell them, like, look here, if you break this, we're going to have problems. Let's look at the scripture in Exodus chapter 31 and verse 15. It says, six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Then you go on to say, whosoever doeth any work, in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. You know why? Because when you break this, when Israel broke the Sabbath, what they were doing was saying that they're having skank regard for the word of the covenant. And what is the word of the covenant? The Ten Commandments. So we establish some things clearly. The Sabbath is the, as it were, the sign between God and Israel, we see that 
the covenant is the Ten Commandments that was given to Israel. And therefore, it's important that we understand its importance uh, as it relates to why Israel had to keep it and not necessarily the church. Well, not the church because it was not assigned to us. And, we're going to, and I'm going to tell you why. As I said before, it, there's a bigger picture at play. Now, let's just look at one other main point as we're kind of coming down to some close. There are three types of laws in the Old Testament. You have what is called the moral law. The moral law is an expression of God's character. It is therefore an unchanging moral standard. And that that's, that's goes without saying because the moral laws are attached to God's character. And one of the things we know about God is that God is immutable, which means that he does not change. So the moral laws of God do not change. That is why the Bible will tell you that, uh, well, well, we'll move there. But the laws is an expression of God's character. It is therefore an unchanging moral standard. It doesn't change because God does not change. However, there's what is called the ceremonial laws. And these have to do with the ordinances and the ceremonies and the sacrifices in the sanctuary. And these things, even though they were very important to Israel, they had an end date. Because they were only a representation of something that was supposed to come. So all the ordinances, for example, all the ceremonies, all the feast days, the Passover, Jesus became our Passover. The first fruit, Jesus was the first fruit of them that slept. Amen. Pentecost, we know what happened on the day of Pentecost. So all of these things are just symbolic of what God was about to do. Ceremonial laws, and therefore they change. You also what is called the civil laws, and these are penalties to impose on people for crimes or any form of restitution that they should get. If, if, if God should extend any form of mercy to them um, for doing a particular thing. So if a man catch leprosy, for example, uh, then we know that he would have to be outside of the camp. Um, he could not come in, could not mingle with the people. He, he had to be considered unclean. Um, that was civil law, putting him outside of the camp. He had to be there for a particular time. Remember Miriam, she had to be outside of the camp for a period of time. Civil law, amen? But as we said before, the moral laws don't change. The ceremonial laws do. And the civil laws do. So, as we look into the Ten Commandments, we realize that it's clear that the nine of the Ten Commandments are moral laws. Very clear. For example, the Bible said, do not commit adultery. Why is that? Why is that a problem? Even outside of, even before Moses actually told them not to commit adultery, it was wrong to commit adultery. Why? Because adultery is unfaithfulness. And guess what? We serve a faithful God. So anything that goes contrary to his morals is you're going to always, uh, God will always have a problem with it. So it's clear that nine of the ten commandments are moral laws. Do not kill. Before Moses came on the scene and said, do not kill. A uh, matter of fact, in Genesis chapter 3 or chapter 4, we find where Cain killed Abel and God, God was upset. And God sent, he got a mark um, because of what he did. Um, he, he, and the Bible talks about the blood of, of Abel cries from the earth. He was wrong long before there was even um, a Ten Commandment. Amen? In the New Testament, the same applies to the point where God said, you shouldn't even talk bad about your brethren because that is murdering too. That's killing the brother spiritually. That's how much God hates it. It goes against his moral who God is. Do not steal applies the same way. Now, it brings me to another question. Another question. Now, we're going, we're, going, we're going to jump into this. When you think about the Sabbath, is the Sabbath a moral law or is the Sabbath a ceremonial law? If you speak to the Adventists, they will tell you that because it falls within the Decalogue, and, with, and I use that term, Decalogue is another term for the Ten Commandments, because it falls within the Ten Commandments, it's a moral law. But notice what I said earlier. Moral laws do not change. Moral laws cannot change. So it makes me, let me ask the question, what do you think? Do you think the Sabbath is a moral law? Or do you think the Sabbath is a ceremonial law? Because that will determine 
its role in the New Testament. If it's a moral law, then it cannot change. If it's a ceremonial law, then there's a bigger picture to it. I put it to you tonight that the ceremonial law, that the Sabbath was not a moral law. And I give two, three reasons. And we're going to jump into this a little bit more as we go along uh, in probably next week. We'll just touch some of these things. But it was not a moral law because I, I give three reasons tonight. One, moral law. All moral laws are established from creation. In other words, it goes, it's like, it's a built-in thing. I don't need to tell Kristen and Kylie, which are my children, that lying is wrong. They know it without the law. They know it without me telling them. Even people who are wicked know that some things that they are doing is just not right. But guess what? As it relates to the Sabbath, God had to tell them that you had to keep the Sabbath. Another thing about the moral laws is that why it could not be a moral law is that it was not binding on all men. All moral laws all moral laws as you will because it comes from the character of God. God is our measuring stick. God is the one who makes us determine what is right and wrong. He is the measuring stick of morality. But guess what? As it relates to the Sabbath, it's not binding on all men. But the Bible clearly states that this is a sign between God and Israel. And number three, it's not a moral law. It's not a moral absolute which cannot be broken under any circumstance. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 5 says, or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath? None of them never keep the Sabbath at some time. But the Bible says, and they are blameless. Because they were accusing Christ of doing something on the Sabbath. He said, look here, the men in the temple do this. There are times when they break the Sabbath too. But guess what? They are blameless. So if they are blameless, it could not be a moral law. Because from you break a moral law, you are formed with blame. You are formed with fault. If you lie, God will deal with you. If you're a thief, God is going to deal with you. Or if you steal, God is going to deal with you. Irrespective of what you do, that's against the character of God. God has to deal with you. But when it comes to the Sabbath, we realize that these bindings do not apply. Praise God. Now, what I have done, trust me, brethren, is just to set a foundation of of what we're going to be touching. Because when we go to the New Testament now, we're going to realize what really the Sabbath is. But let me leave one important thing with you. Going into the Bible, in the scripture in Matthew chapter 17 from verse 1 to 5 and verse 8. And this is very important. I want to leave this one with you. Just to touch you about what God is going to do in the New Testament. It says... After six days, Jesus taken Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bring them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, so be excited now because, I mean, you're here, you're shining, and all of a sudden, Moses came and Elijah came. And they're saying, Peter said, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou will let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Praise God. Now the other verse, verse 8 says this. Well, the scripture went on. It says, And while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Why well, you take note of these things? I'm going to make the point. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw nobody else save Jesus only. Let me leave this with you today people who need to understand what you're a part of. Amen? The Old Testament is often called the laws and the prophets. 
That is what the Bible refers to the Old Testament, the laws and the prophets. It's fair to think that these two particular persons from the Old Testament appeared because they represented the law, which is Moses, and the prophets, which is Elijah. So the sum of the Old Testament revelation came and met with Jesus at the mountain of transfiguration. At the mountain of transfiguration, there stood Jesus, the antitype, Moses and Elijah, which is the type, the law and the prophets, and Jesus. Now here it is, at first, Peter got excited and said, let us build a temple and make all three of us remain here. And this seemed to be the best. Why not? Make all three of you be here. All three of you can exist. But what the Bible brought out was the fact that now that Jesus had come, Moses and Elijah had to fade away and can never be put at the same level with Jesus. What we have in Jesus Christ is far superior to everything that existed under the law. It's far exists far superior to everything that existed in the prophets. Because he is the fulfillment. He is the antitype. He is the actual full represent, well, better yet, they are the representation and he is the full body of what they represented. When you leave and say you're going to do stuff like this, you're going to observe back the Sabbath again. And you're going to do this. I'm going to touch this next week. You're like the Galatians where Paul said, Oh foolish Galatians, who had bewitched you that you should still observe days and time. I know what Paul was talking about. You can say for the law in its fulfillment, everything in the law was just a shadow of things to come. But now we have the real substance, Christ. Tonight we can be joyful that we are living in a better covenant. We can be joyful that we have a better high priest. We can be joyful that we have a better sacrifice. We can be joyful that we have a better Sabbath. And what we're going to do, men and brethren, next week when we jump into the New Testament, we have set a foundation. We have examined the scripture in Genesis account. We have looked at the law and what it represented. We look at the fact that the law was given by Moses and was given to the children of Israel. We established the fact that the Ten Commandments is the word of the covenant. We said that a covenant is between God and somebody else. We look at the sign of the covenant. And the sign of the covenant, which is in the middle of the whole covenant, is the Sabbath. We look at the fact that the sign of the covenant uh, was between God and Israel. When Israel kept the Sabbath, it said to people that were looking on that these people are a people of the constitution of heaven. The constitution that happened at Sinai. But we have a better constitution. And we have a better seal. A better sign. We look at the different types of laws that exist. We look at the fact that there was a moral law which is hinging the character of God. We look at the fact that there is a ceremonial law that speaks to his ordinances and the, the festivals and the feasts. We look at the fact that there is a civil law. And we ask the question, is the Sabbath a moral law or a civil law? Is that moral law or a ceremonial law? You know what is interesting? And I'll leave you with this. If a child was born on the Sabbath day, What do you think they would have done? You think that I would have said because it's the Sabbath day they're not going to circumcise him? No. Circumcision exceeded the Sabbath. The only way you can get into the covenant is through circumcision. So it shows you again that if Sabbath was a moral law, it could not have been broken. But God says you have to circumcise the man because the only time he's a part of the Israel covenant community is when he is circumcised according to the Abrahamic covenant. 
my name brethren we're going to finish this topic next week we're going to look into the new testament jesus said the sabbath was made for man and not man for the sabbath what does these things mean colossians said let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink what does these things mean uh, we're going to try to look now into the new testament seeing that we have an understanding of the foundation of the old testament and let us ask god to continue to open our understanding brethren brethren god has called us to some great things in him let us not be like the judaizers who came into the church and tried to pull them back into the laws of moses no we have better things under god so let us stay in our better covenant with a better rest god richly bless you bow your heads as i pray great god we exalt you we magnify your name for there's none like you there's none to be compared to you we thank you god that your word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword we thank you god that in your word there is spirit and there is life we thank you god that we know that this letter kill it but the spirit gives life we thank you jesus that you have given us a better rest you said in your words come unto me all you that weary and are heavy laden and i will give you rest that word is sabbath you have given us rest we thank you god that you open our understanding to the scriptures help us god that we become diligent students of your word help us lord jesus to study to show ourselves approved unto you help us lord to 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 be happy and joyful in what you have given us a better covenant a better high priest a better sacrifice we have better testimony and they without us cannot be made perfect god we're not boasting per se but we are boasting knowing that you have called us at this time to be the bride of christ and you have given us some things heavenly things god things that are far superior i mean thank you lord jesus that as you said to peter as your voice came from heaven and Jesus was standing there alone. And you said, this is your son, hear him. God help us to realize that everything uh, that is hinged in this covenant is based on your words. Help us to realize that the whole covenant has faded away. But we are now living, uh, God, into the true and free gospel of your Holy Spirit. God bless us. Help us, Lord Jesus, to continue to be in your word. Thank you, God, again for another Bible study. And help us, God, to come back even next week to take our time and to go through the things that we have discussed tonight so that next week we can build a proper foundation going into the New Testament about your Sabbath and what really is the Sabbath in this time. God, thank you again as we look to you, the author, the finish of our faith, the God of heaven. Jesus is your name. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Remember that Bishop Daly's book is coming out soon. And get yourselves ready to get a copy. It should be an excited read. Amen. And we want to ensure that we support the kingdom of God and the things of God. Because it's all for his glory. God bless you. In Jesus' name.